Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are internationally. I'm Dr. Myers. I'm with internal with internal medicine with USF infectious disease. Uh, the first thing I'd like to tell you all today is that uh, this is being recorded, so everyone will have access to this recording after the uh, event is over. I'd like to introduce our very well known and famous speaker today, Dr. Christian Bichot. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Research and Global Affairs, Associate Vice Dean, Associate Vice President for International Partnerships and Innovation, and Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the USF Department of Internal Medicine. Dr. Bichot leads the USF Microbiome Initiative and is the co-founder of the Microbiome Immunology and Infection Mitigation Hub in the Pandemic Response Research Network. Since 2017, Dr. Bruchot has been the president of the Global Virus Network, a network of 57 research centers, 11 affiliates in 33 countries worldwide, headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. Before serving as president of the Pasteur Institute from 2013 to 2017, Dr. Bruchot was vice president of the Medical and Scientific Affairs at Institute Mirieux, a company that develops new approaches to fight infectious diseases and cancers. He also served as the general director of INSERM, the French National Agency for Biomedical Research from 2002 to 2007, as professor of hepatology and cell biology at Necker School of Medicine, Paris Descartes University. He led the clinical department of liver diseases at Necker Infant Maldés Hospital from 1997 to 2001. Authoring more than 400 articles in medical and scientific research journals, Dr. Bruchot Institute for Scientific Information as the fourth most cited author on the topic of hepatitis C. He has been recognized as an inventor on 18 patents and helped create three biotechnology companies, Rare Cells, Alfact Innovation, and the Healthy Aging Company. Dr. Bruchot's research activities have focused on viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and C, <coughs> particularly with regard to their role in liver cancer, hepatocellular cancer, and the molecular mechanisms that drive liver regeneration in cancer in particular cell cycle deregulation and the impact of oxidative stress. He has been the member of numerous scientific committees and societies and has received many prestigious awards. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and companion, compatriot and colleague, Dr. Bruchot. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ando. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for a very nice introduction and uh, Thank you all for this uh, invitation. It's really always a pleasure to be uh, with uh, my friends of, uh, and colleagues at, uh, at USF and I very I enjoy very much being, being working at USF and also at the Global Virus Network. And I know that I have some friends of Global Virus Network who, who will be attending also this, uh, this presentation. So I'm going now to share my uh, first my slides. So here it comes. Yes. So again, thank you so much, Andrew, for the introduction. And this presentation will be based on, uh, I would say, my position both at USF and as president of the Global Virus Network. What I really want to show is uh, actually a large part of the presentation will be based on the conclusions of a workshop that we have organized in September for the Global Virus Network, and I will present what the Global Virus Network is about and some of our activities. And I have also added uh, some recent findings. So it will be a mix, I would say, uh, between a presentation of the Global Virus Network and also introducing activities at USF and some points uh, regarding COVID-19. Now, to close this introduction, obviously, I will not be able to cover everything on COVID-19. And so, by definition, I will not present on some uh, important points. So, just I will start with some general points, explain why we need this network, these networks, and then, again, present some conclusions of the GVN workshop in September. So we all know this. I mean, we have been facing over the past 30 years 
very significant numbers of emerging and re-emerging infectious disease, many, many of them, most of them, being of viral uh, origin. And so it's about how to prepare, how to react, how to build for the future. And obviously, we will come back to this education, training, talent development are at the forefront of this uh, strategy. And now we have COVID-19 and it only further uh, reinforce, obviously, this need. So we also know, but this is very important to emphasize, that because it has consequence, that this is really about global and one health, and not only global health. Because of this uh, tight interplay between the uh, animals, most of these viral infections, about 70% of them are of uh, animal origins. So this interplay between the uh, animal reservoir, the human health and the environment. And it is clear that this acceleration that we are witnessing in the number of uh, epidemics and pandemics uh, uh, is largely in part related uh, to human factors, urbanization, deforestation, human migrations, and also climate change. Now, before coming to uh, the global virus network and the needs, it, it, what is really sad, uh, and I, I, I really take this word sad, when we think of COVID-19, is that following up on the HIV crisis and then on the Ebola crisis, a lot of uh, progress had been made regarding preparation. I'm not going to list all of these uh, institutions, but basically they had been created to uh, promote a more international collaboration and to really uh, prepare better uh, for new epidemics. The most recent one, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, is a very interesting model of a consortium between governments, foundations, agencies, WHO, industrial partners to prepare for stockpiles of vaccines. And actually, CEPI plays an important role for COVID-19 vaccine presently. However, despite all of this, we have not been prepared enough. We have networks. This is a network organized by the WHO, so-called the GOAN for Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, and they are doing a good job as trying to coordinate. But however, and this may be a topic for debate, but we know that the WHO needs reorganization to really play uh, its, uh, its role. So the concept of network is a simple one, but a very important one. And it is by no means contradictory with the fact that uh, research agencies, be national or international, large foundations play a key role in the research and in the surveillance with the CDCs and so on. But in addition to this, not instead of this, it is clear that we need to have new organizations, organizational schemes to really bring together uh, scientists, medical doctors, public health officers all over the world. So this is why Bob Gallo has founded with Billy Hall and uh, Reinhard Hall the Global Virus Network in 2011, based in Baltimore. Now I will come to this. USF in Tampa is also a regional headquarter, and it's really a coalition of leading virologists to advance discovery and knowledge, to develop drugs and vaccines and also diagnostic tests. So look at the right part of the slide. It's a, I will come back to this, but it's about research. It's about training and education. It's about, and this is also very important, advocacy and public education. This is a small team, and I want to mention that Lin Man Lee, who really uh, has been and is still at USF, uh, is now the vice president. And uh, then we have several of my friends who are doing an excellent job uh, in Baltimore 
uh, and obviously interacting with the board and with Bob Gallo and uh, so a number of scientists. The Global Virus Network is based on what we call centers of excellence. All of this is quite simple, but very efficient, you see. So we identify GVN centers of excellence based on their quality, on their production, but also on their willingness to really embark and to be part of the GVN and to contribute uh, to the activities of the GVN. So this is... I believe a very impressive network now. 57 centers of excellence, 11 that we call affiliated, which means at a, a relatively early stage, and in 33 countries all over the world due to the mixing between the interplay also with the Pasteur Institute, with the Fondation Merieux, which explains the different colors, but this is not uh, this is not the point today. What is important is the very large coverage uh, worldwide. So this slide just illustrates that, uh, although now I'm going to speak about uh, obviously about COVID-19, but the Global Virus Network is about all human viruses. And this list means that when you look by viruses, by categories of viruses, you will always find excellent experts uh, within the GVN to address any uh, human virus. We are working with international meetings. We had a number of them. Uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, uh, the one in September this year was a virtual a uh, special meeting which was fully devoted to uh, pandemics in the modern era, but mostly obviously on COVID-19. And uh, so these are many of the speakers. And what I'm going to take now, uh, I really want to start from some of their conclusions, uh, also to add uh, some new findings and really try to make some, uh, I would say, updates on different aspects of COVID-19. So this is a huge pandemic. I always find this figure so impressive, which has devastated, there is no other word, uh, the world uh, in, in a few months. And why, I mean, we, we were, I have emphasized at the beginning of this conversation, uh, the progress which had been made, but we were not sufficiently prepared. And what is important for the future, and that was very clear uh, during the workshop, is that we are not facing another uh, public health crisis. We have entered a new era. It's about multidisciplinary pandemic response networks, and we are working on uh, coordinating the different networks because obviously GVN is not the only network and we have tentatively suggested creating a viral pandemic readiness alliance between these different networks. As I have emphasized, this is about global and one health, it's about training, it's also, and this is so important, to provide a reliable channel for disseminating the scientific knowledge independent, science-driven. So, first question is, why coronavirus? Uh, this is the seventh documented human coronavirus. We know this. Four cause common colds, three cause severe disease, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and now SARS-CoV-2. Now, it's interesting that five of the seven have recently emerged over the last 20 years, and this is not by chance. It's just related to the factors I have listed. And bats are involved in the emergence of five. And when you compare, the, for example, the hantaviruses, which is another category of virus, completely different. Host jumping is only sporadic. But when you look at coronaviruses, this is quite frequent. And to be honest, and I don't want to, fri to frighten anybody, but it is clear that we have at least four coronaviruses in bats which are ready to go, which doesn't need, mean that we, we will have other pandemics, but it means that we are at risk of having other pandemics. 
So then the question is, can we predict? Uh, and uh, we had a very interesting conversation on this because you see, uh, you have some networks where they want to sequence all the viruses all over the world, which is all very good and will provide knowledge. But genomic prediction won't work. This is at least our opinion. Because of the huge number of possible viruses, because the genome sequencing by itself does not really identify those viruses we can infect or spread, uh, that it will take a huge number of person health and a huge budget. And what is shown on the right part of the slide is that phylogenetic comparisons do, do not really help to predict uh, the next pandemic because phy phylogenetic comparisons, they consider evolutionary time scales in millions of years while as shown on the slide, emergence will occur on an epidemiological time scale, that means in decades. So we, we cannot only rely on this. So really it's about surveillance, taking in account what I have just said, humans are modifying the ecosystem and accelerate the transmission event. Animal viruses are at the heart of this new a pandemic, so humans are the best sentinels. We must focus the surveillance efforts on the human population who interface with animals, and we can do much better in many countries, and we need to establish global data sharing mechanisms. So how to do things better? Well, we need to fight the climate change, reduce obviously our exposure to wildlife, very difficult for the markets, as we know, for example, in China, this is part of their culture. Establish global genomic, serological and social media surveillance of people living and working at the human-animal interface. We have, we all know this, but we must emphasize that we have in hand the tools for modern genomic epidemiology, and this was very nicely presented by Eddie Holmes from the University of Sydney. And again, I don't want to go on data in details for these slides, but we really have the capacity to sequence, to perform data analysis. And actually, if we look back, the virus was sequenced on January 5th in China. And I must emphasize, that the Chinese scientists, they did send the information to the other members of uh, the Global Virus Network. Now, the second point I want to take is about the uh, pathogenesis and some hints, I would say, on uh, treatments. We know, uh, this is a classical side now, that uh, coming from the pre-symptomatic on the left, symptomatic in the middle, recovery on the right, we have a journey through viral replication, which will only last for a few days, actually. So antivirals are only potentially useful very early uh, during the infection. And then we have the innate response, the cellular and the humoral response, and then the bottom part of the slide, we have the, the fact that it starts with the epithelium, then it's really a disease which is related to the monocyte. It is a famous cytokine release syndrome. And then if things go worse with uh, an acute respiratory distress syndrome, neutrophils are on play. And we will have to address the questions of long haul symptoms and real recovery, and many things are unclear on this. So having said that, I cannot, uh, my slide do not want to move. Oh, I don't know why. Ah, okay. So the first point I want to take is that a recent finding uh, is very important to understand how this virus work. I mean, uh, this is about the finding that in addition to the S2, which is now well recognized as a receptor, neuropilin 1 is another receptor which facilitates SARS-CoV-2 entry in the cell. And in red, in the middle of the slide, uh, these are two companion papers recently published in Science 
pathological analysis of olfactory epithelium obtained from human COVID-19 autopsies demonstrate that SARS-CoV-2 infects NRP1 positive cells facing the nasal cavity. In other words, this virus not only enters the pulmonary uh, and pharyngeal epithelium, but really directly, directly infects uh, the, the brain and, uh, uh, in, in, in particular, in the nasal cavity. So this is extremely important when we think of the different treatments. A second point I want to take is really the impact of the host human genetics. These are very recent findings, very provocative, and they will lead, possibly in the future, uh, to a new um, advance, I would say, regarding diagnostic and potentially treatment. We all know that the end result of a viral infection is a balance between the virus and the host. This slide is from Jean-Laurent Casanova, who has uh, driven a very large consortium and has published two breakthrough papers in science recently. And what it shows is a summary. On the left, you have the fact that when you compare asymptomatic on the left and life threatening and patients with life threatening infections, and you analyze their genetics you find in about 3.5% in this paper, but this is just a start, some genetic defects in genes which control the type 1 interferon pathway. Very interestingly, on the right, when you again compare asymptomatic and those with severe infection, at least 10% of them show autoantibodies to type 1 interferon. And this is really a very, very uh, completely new findings, uh, which really means that it further increases the, the, the fact that focusing on the interferon pathway is a very important point. Now, in addition to this, this is a very striking paper recently published in Nature. What, what they show if they identify a, a, a locus, a genetic locus, which is a risk factor, again, for severe COVID-19, they demonstrate that this is inherited from Neanderthals. And when you look at the geographic map, well, there is one continent, which for obvious reason, when we think of, to, of Neanderthal, ha, has been spared, I would say. It's Africa. And we know that in Africa, COVID-19, uh, severe COVID-19 is relatively rare. Now, it may be, and it will be, uh, because of a, a number of factors, not a single factor, uh, young age of the population and many things that we can discuss. But now there is the interesting possibility is that some genetic traits may also uh, be different, obviously, and may uh, be at stake. And if we go back to the autoantibodies, we know that in a, a geographic areas such as Africa, in general, in general, you have less autoantibodies. So there is a path uh, which might account for some um, characteristic, I would say, of the pandemics, and which again may have consequence for diagnostic and for treatment. Treatment. One of the conclusion of the uh, of the workshop was really that we should not only focus on drug repurposing, and that although we know that drug discovery takes time, but we know that we have to focus on this also to target multiple pathways, combining antivirals and immunomodulatory molecules, and also. There is a lot of effort, and that will be key for our future, to develop broad spectrum antivirals. This slide shows that we have a huge number of clinical trials, and uh, USF and TGF have been very active on this. At the end of the day, well, very few convincing results. Remdesivir, this is debated, and debated is a soft wording. And at the end of the day, steroids have been uh, a best result, but not a completely unexpected result. Having said that, we have new findings, which are really based on, on the discovery of new molecules. 
Therapeutic monoclonal antibodies targeting the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. We know this. The FDA has approved now the antibodies from Lilly and from Regeneron, and they can be used effective for early stage of mild and moderate COVID-19, but they will require a continuous evaluation of safety and effectiveness of this treatment. Situation is very different for the monoclonal antibodies which aim to curve the COVID-19 cytokine storm. Uh, again, I will not go into detail. You see in the slides about targeting IL-6, IL-1, JAK-STAT. Well, there, the literature has a lot of contradiction. We need to wait, but it is clear uh, that a lot of work is needed before we can really assess the safety and effectiveness. This is an example of a work which has been presented at the workshop and now is uh, in press. It's about baricitinib, so targeting the jack, uh, uh, the, 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 the jack pathway, you see. And uh, what is shown on the lower part of the slide, the main finding, is that when you treat uh, the uh, rhesus macaques which have been infected by SARS-CoV-2 uh, with this drug, clearly you reduce inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, uh, you reduce the recruitment of neutrophils and macrophages, of the activation of T cells, and you preserve the innate antiviral response. So, this type of results is really encouraging now. Obviously, it has to be really well established uh, in humans. Now, you see, this slide is to emphasize that we have drug repurposing, we have drug discovery, and we have, and this is key in, in, in science in general, well, what we get when we start with an unbiased analysis, such as high throughput screening, and also when it comes to serendipity. And I just want to provide briefly three examples. Nitazoxonide, I must disclose that I'm an advisor to Romar company. This is a very interesting story of an anti-parasitic drug with excellent safety profile and now shows in vitro and possibly in vivo activity against SARS-CoV-2, that one. Second, the fascinating hypothesis of the uh, nicotine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and COVID-19 connection. And then a very recent one uh, on the uh, potential use of antihistamines, targeting the histamine 1 receptor binding class uh, to curve again uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. So I will take two examples, nitazoxonides and the uh, nicotine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So as I said, this nitazoxonide is an anti-parasitic agent, excellent safety profiles. At least 100 million of people have been treated against these various uh, infections. And then uh, came the fact, and I will not have time to discuss the mechanism, that actually this drug is active in vitro, but with excellent EC50 range on a number of viruses. And you can see on the third lane that comes coronaviridae. It was at that time Kenin coronavirus, murin uh, coronavirus. And uh, this is also against MERS-CoV, uh, nitazoxonide and its metabolite tazoxonide have clearly an effect on the virus. You can see the decrease in the virus titer. And now studies from completely different groups have shown that nitazoxonide has antiviral activity on SARS-CoV-2 in cell culture and in an animal model. And this is a study published in uh, Brazil, uh, which we have to be very careful, but it's a multi-center, double-blind, well-conducted placebo-controlled trial on 392 patients. As a five-day study visit, the symptom resolution did not differ between nitazoxonide and placebo. However, at one week, 
uh, it, there was a significant difference in the favor of nitazoxonide. But in addition to this, when you look at this slide, you clearly have a very significant reduction at five days of the viral load in the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, and there are some ongoing clinical studies in Tampa Bay, and uh, USF has been engaged in these uh, studies, and we will have the results at the end of the year. The question is, can we prevent uh, COVID-19 with such approach? And again, we have to be very careful. The second is really from Jean-Pierre Changeux in the Institute Pasteur and then collaborators. It's the fascinating uh, observation, which holds true in most studies, that smokers are less infected by COVID-19, and I immediately want to emphasize that I'm not advocating for smoking. Uh, nicotinic acid receptor is an immunomodulator, uh, and the, there is evidence for nicotinic acetyl receptor binding to SARS-CoV-2. And so there are some ongoing clinical studies in Paris on using nicotine patches as treatments. And uh, we will see the result because unfortunately there is a second wave in France nowadays and they have the capacity to enroll and we will know, uh, we will soon see the results. So now I want to move on diagnostics. Uh, this is an underappreciated topic in my view. Uh, we need rapid diagnostic tests, obviously. One of the conclusions you see of many studies performed in GVN, but also outside GVN, is that we can have now new technologies, new, new sampling procedures. And it is, I would say, sad uh, to, to see that the translation from the technological progress uh, on diagnostic to really the population <coughs> has been slow. Salivary sampling, although we have to be careful, we all agree on this, can be used. Uh, you can use, I will show a slide in one minute, other molecular tests than PCR. Obviously, serologic assays are key. What it means is that we need novel organizational schemes. We need to, to have, just as for vaccines, such consortia between industrial, academics, um, including governments, foundations, to be better prepared to react when a new virus comes and to really test in advance. We cannot test, of, obviously, a new diagnostic test if we do not know which virus we are facing. But we can test uh, the sampling procedures and the different methodologies. So this is an example from Dr. Pardis Sabeti at Harvard, at Broad. And they have developed from left to right a process which is very efficient, collecting the saliva. This is a, a lamp, so isothermal uh, amplification system with a readout with a smartphone. Turnaround time of 65 minutes, really low cost. Uh, you have even more fancy technology with the CRISPR-based technology, where what is shown in the middle is that using Cas13, which is part of the CRISPR system, I do not have time to go into detail, you can cleave the hybrid uh, between your probe and the target RNA, and this in turn leads to uh, uh, the detection of uh, fluorescence. This is on the right, uh, right part of the slide, or alternatively, some colorimetric readout on paper, and all of this interpreted with a smartphone. We really have this. It's not something which is for the future, which is about YouTube, and we need to use this if we really want to uh, reconcile economy and health. We absolutely need to have this technology. We will go when we will go to the restaurants, when we will go to our work, when we will go to the airport, we will be tested repeatedly, but in a way which has nothing to do with the way we are tested now. 
And this is an application uh, that, uh, so they have a collaboration with the Sarasota Military Academy, and now we are organizing with uh, Esa Oxner, with Tom Unash, and uh, with others, we are really organizing a collaboration with them uh, for USF, which will be very interesting. This is just a very recent publication. This is a preprint from Switzerland. But you see, this is a prospective, very good study, comparative clinical trial. First, they investigate rapid antigen tests, different uh, kits. And you can see that in B, you have those patients with a high viral load. And as, for, uh, as seen with other studies, then the rapid antigen does compared with the standard molecular assay. On the less part, it is a little bit less sensitive when you are talking of patients with a lower uh, viral load, but if you repeat the test, then you can cope with this. How to repeat the test? In the same study, they have compared saliva PCR um, in green, in pale green, uh, with the uh, NP-PCR, nasopharyngeal PCR, and you can see that the results are about the same. And so there is no reason not to evaluate this and to move. And finally, serendipity, can the dogs smell COVID? Uh, we will see. So finally, COVID vaccine. We all know this is a huge breakthrough, many, many vaccines in development, some of them leading, obviously, the field, BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, and to some extent, AstraZeneca with their adenovirus. There are many questions. You know them, but I just want to list them because they are key. What is the duration of protection? But we have to remember that even if the protection is short, that will be very useful to contain clusters. What is the real efficacy in elderly in patients with diabetes? Uh, does it protect against asymptomatic infections, against severe infections? Can we define, and that will be key, correlates of protections, biomarkers, and obviously, what is the safety, not only the short-term safety, and what is the risk, if any, in uh, individuals who are already anti-SARS-CoV-2 positive. Uh, so we all know that you have a number of priorities which are being set, but it's about logistic. But we should not forget at the end of this, that in addition to this vaccine, not instead of, we have non-specific immunization procedures which have shown their efficacy, such as BCG or oral poliovirus, and for example, Bob Gallo and uh, Konstantin Chumarov at the, in, at the GVN are actively working on the oral poliovirus as a means to stimulate the innate immune response uh, and to enhance the efficacy of the overall immunization process. And it will be about evaluating the second generation vaccines. Uh, will we have or not some more important cellular immune response and the benefits of this? So what is the impact of SARS-CoV-2 mutations in this context? Well, we know that uh, this coronavirus, as for other coronavirus, shows an overall low rate of mutations. Presently, there is no demonstrated impact on infection severity. There is real evidence for one mutation, the famous D614G, uh, for enhancing contagiousness. This mutation has occurred in February and is in part, obviously only in part, but involved in the dissemination of the pandemics. Do we have an impact on neutralization capacity? This is key. The answer is no uh, for the D614G. There is a very recent mutation, I will show one slide. This is being published by a very good group at Rockefeller, which suggests that some mutations at least might impact on neutralization capacity. I want to be clear, it doesn't mean that uh, vaccines will fail, and we don't know if the cellular immune response is impacted by this mutation. And there is the very puzzling story 
uh, mostly in, in uh, Netherlands, but now also in France, of SARS-CoV-2 transmitted by infected minks and with some variants among these viruses. This is one slide on the, this paper, the circulating SARS-CoV-2 spike variant N439K maintained fitness while evading antibody-mediated antibody immunity, mutation which has been shown on the right part to originate in Europe, Scotland and other parts of Europe, but possibly having also moved to the, uh, to the US. But again, we don't know, uh, and this just has to be really uh, confirmed. Uh, finally, uh, this is something which really brings the USF and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the Global Virus Network, and I, I, I'm taking maybe too much time, so I will go fast, but it is clear that uh, the gut microbiota of patients with COVID-19 is an important player uh, to evaluate, to determine the sensitivity to COVID-19 and the severity of the infection. And it goes really, it integrates obviously very well with the USF Initiative Institute on Microbiome. So this is a paper which has been published in Gastroenterology. Just have a look at the upper right part of the slide. Clearly, uh, you have very striking modifications of the gut microbiome in patients with COVID-19. Actually, they last even after um, uh, disparition of the virus from the, from the lung. Uh, and there is a correlation between the presence of some of the bacteria and the severity of the infection. And this has led to a very interesting protocol which is starting a collaboration between Rutgers and USF with Dr. Li Ping Zhao and Essa Oxner is, can we modulate actually the gut microbiota and influence COVID-19? And this is a study which is based on finding from Li Ping Zhao, they have defined on the left what they call foundation guide, that means a number of bacteria which uh, um, drive production of short chain fatty acid, of a number of molecules with improved glycemic control, suppress opportunistic pathogens, boost antiviral immunity. And they have a nutrient preparation which stimulates, this is in blue, as compared to the red, the, uh, these bacteria when administered to patients. So this is a randomized study, and it will be very interesting to see the results. So all of this goes well, is obviously consistent with what Shyam Mohapatra and myself are driving with the research hub on microbiome immunology and infection mitigation, and also a program that we have initiated on food uh, with the University of South Florida Tampa Bay Metropolitan Food Park, which really and to investigate how you can impact on the soil microbiome, uh, impact then in turn on the plants, then on the food, then on the gut microbiome on the right part of the slide, and then on health. It's a very large program, very comprehensive, but which again, this is why I wanted to show the slide, only refer to the fact that modulating the microbiome one way or the other may have a beneficial impact for the population and for the patients. So how do we translate all this progress to, uh, to really the, the benefit of the population? And I, I will close my presentation and I will skip some slides on the role of the Global Virus Network. This is, we have a number of programs, I will not detail them on research, training and education, advocacy, we have very excellent training activities with a short course for emerging leaders in virology, obviously on site in Baltimore uh, the past years, but now it will be online. And we have generated a total of 90 scientists from around the world who are really alumni and who are really disseminated, disseminating worldwide the knowledge that they have uh, obtained. Uh, we are really now moving uh, 
further with what we call the DVN Academy program to really help what uh, young uh, people that we call young rising stars. It's not only one training, it's not only one fellowship, it's about, it's about really, really mentoring uh, and the follow-up of their career track. And we have created, uh, and this is uh, the first official partnership between GVN and USF, the GVN and USF online course, which has now started, and I hope that many of you will be interested, with the uh, microbiome and uh, their impact, the impact of this microbiome on viral infection. And these are many distinguished speakers. So we have at GVN a task force and we have many activities on SARS-CoV-2, uh, which go from uh, webinars, uh, from uh, just regular, from time to time conversations between scientists from the whole world to a biobanking project to research and clinical trials. And this illustrates some of these uh, highlights with the task force, with the distributed biobanking project, and we are also intermediate, I would say, between some companies and centers to promote, to help develop research and clinical trials. We have a lot of partnership with industry. This is really, I would say, a legacy of the GVN from its inspection. Uh, a lot of public education and the webinars which have been really initiated by, by Lin Man Lee, uh, have really a great success. And I hope that many of you may be interested by this series of webinars, which really provide new information. It's about also education. It's about education at USF, newsletters, spotlights that we have on our website. And I really encourage you to go to the website and it's about advocacy and communication. And we all know, and that will be key for the vaccine acceptance over the next months, how much a number of political, of political stances, I would say, uh, but also fake news and so on have been very detrimental. And so we are working on this and USF is also very active on this. So to close, I really believe these are paintings from Magritte, a Belgium painter that I very much like, that the GVN, the, the interaction between GVN and USF, and all of what we are doing, all of us, on COVID-19, are really nicely developing, and we really hope that we will be able to cope. Um, I really want to thank, I do not have a lot of time for this, but the GVN team, the GVN Centers of Excellence, the USF Health International Office, and many of our center directors. I took some uh, slides from them. I really thank Lin Man Lee for helping me preparing this talk. And that will be my final slide. I always like to show it. This is during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone. Uh, this is really what we are looking for when we wake up in the morning and we go to work. It's about thank you science and this is what we want to achieve all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. That was wonderful. I've got a few questions for you if I may. I think first, uh, in, in my experience working in the hospital and having patients with coronavirus, you talked about trying to give the patients antivirals um, as soon as we can. That's probably when they're most effective. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And strange enough, uh, we do not have yet a specific, I would say, antiviral, because uh, I don't know what is your opinion, but Remdesivir at best shows very minor effects. And uh, so this is really, so there are some anti-protease which are being developed. We hope, we hope that they will be effective. And then you have a molecule with a non-specific antiviral activity, such as nitazoxonide or others. But this is something that we are badly lacking. 
some efficient drugs at this stage? Yeah, I, I think that's something that I struggle with is we say we want to give these antivirals early. As you said, they're not, they don't seem to be you know that helpful, but most of the time early would be before they're really showing symptoms. So I really think that it is oxenide that you know has a lot of promise. But when someone comes to the hospital and they're short of breath, maybe on a liter or two of oxygen, I feel like we've kind of already missed the boat for antivirals at that point. We should have given them earlier. You agree? Absolutely. That's exactly the point. And this is also why uh, the, the fact that uh, this clinical trial will also investigate whether you can have prevention uh, in patients, in individuals at risk would be obviously a great accomplishment. But again and again, we don't know. We don't have the results yet. Yeah, and then I guess on the other side of things, I also worry about my you know, long haulers, I think we're calling them now, patients who, you know, it's been maybe a month or longer. Do we have any promising uh, therapeutics for those patient populations? You mean those who, sorry, I didn't exactly get the point. Sure, so patients that have you know, diagnosed with COVID-19 and now it's a month later and they're still having trouble breathing, they're still right. maybe having fevers. If they're clearly past that initial viral window, but is there any treatments that we have or are developing for those patients? Well, I believe that so far we have nothing and I agree with you. And that would be increasingly important because for obvious reasons, uh, we will have a increasingly high number of such uh, patients. No, I, 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 and it's very difficult because we have to better characterize this patient. What exactly is going on? Do they have still a burst of cytokines? Do they have, what exactly is their uh, immunological profile? That's really something that we need to get. Yeah, and I think that leads into another question I have. You know, you were talking about a cytokine release syndrome that you know is, is occurring. I I personally, and you would know much more about this than I would have read about maybe a bradykine release syndrome versus a cytokine release syndrome. Um, where are we going, or you know, what are your thoughts on on that? Well, I believe that the wording cytokine storm and syndrome is very vague, mm -hmm. and I believe that we are using, and I did use it also, these words, but we really, are, we are not exactly clear as to what is going on. And actually, and you know this very well, we go back to general points regarding sepsis. We all know that in sepsis, it's extremely complicated, that you have phases of immunostimulatory and then immunodepression. And this is why actually we have to recognize but we do not have a real treatment for sepsis. So I suspect that we are facing the same, but actually we do not have a homogeneous profile. Uh, and so I believe that it's a very, very important topic for research, for clinical research, to better decipher correlates of severity. Uh, and, and I'm sure that we will have several different profiles within what we call cytokine storms. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, you know, for therapeutics that you were talking about the, the baricitinib, I believe, which is a, a jack. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've had, you know, different trials here at USF and at Tampa General Hospital um, with IL-6 inhibitors and then with jack inhibitors. You know, we haven't really gone anywhere, at least with the IL-6 inhibitors, and those have kind of not really shown a lot of promise with the, with the JAK inhibitors as well. I think there's some concern about getting other infections because you are blunting the immune response, correct? Yeah, yeah that's also very true. As soon as you are immunomodulating, you may be in trouble. So what we can only tell at this stage is that this drug, but that was an animal model, but a good animal model, a fairly good animal model, but still an animal model, the results have been very interesting. But I agree with you. Well, we have to try. Also, the point is that when we say it inhibits the jack, uh, uh, 
it's very complicated. And actually, these drugs have a multiplicity of uh, cellular effects, you see. So this may explain also why some would not be efficient, others would be efficient. We, we have to test. We have to test. Yeah. Um, <laughs> looking at the vaccines, as you said, there's a lot of promising vaccines. Uh, some may even get EUAs here in the US in the next week or two. Yeah. Do you, I know that they're, the way the vaccines are made, you talked about this a little bit, but if you could expand upon it, is a little bit different using mRNA or different ways of making vaccines that, to my knowledge, haven't really been done previously, correct? No, that's so. That's a, a breakthrough for vaccine for against COVID-19, but also a breakthrough for uh, uh, for the RNA-based vaccine, because it's the first time that they really would demonstrate uh, efficacy. Uh, and then, but you also have the AstraZeneca case, although it's a little bit more complicated, but it's an adenovirus. The way I see it is that, first, we all agree. We, I, I will be vaccinated when I will be. You see, many times I'm asked, would you be vaccinated? <laughs> and my answer is, yes, I will be vaccinated. But obviously, as everybody, I want to see all the data and the approval of the FDA and the European uh, regulatory agency. But this mRNA, by directly targeting uh, the cell, the cell and the synthesis by the cell of the protein, uh, by avoiding uh, the use of viral vectors and so on, has been for many years a very promising uh, area. But uh, as you said, uh, now they, they, they really have uh, uh, excellent results, that's for sure. Uh, we always should keep in mind that when, when we think of safety, it means a two months follow up. So clearly this is why it makes sense to vaccinate uh, individuals who are at risk, because we still need a number of longitudinal studies, you see, before moving to mass vaccination. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious, you I think know a little bit more the differences between in Europe and in the US as far as the regulatory bodies. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, are they close to approving a vaccine? And if so, which one? Well, it's about the same, the same pace as in the US, actually. And they are working in close connections. The uh, BioNTech Pfizer has been leading the uh, the competition, uh, but and so is presently the first. But Moderna will be approved very soon, and so uh, uh, exactly as in the US, actually. The problem is that you see in France, the regulatory authority has issued now some statements yesterday as to how to vaccinate, and you have a problem of number of doses. You see, even despite the huge effort. So anyway. We need some time before having in hand all the necessary doses. But this is good because I believe that we have to start step by step. We cannot move immediately for a wide vaccination uh, uh, organization. Okay, I've got one more question. Uh, you were talking about using the maybe the, the BCG vaccine or you know something yeah. like that. Uh, can you expand upon that a little bit more, how that would be useful? Yeah, you see, there have been very interesting observations for many years on the fact, for example, that individuals who have been, been vaccinated by the oral polio virus in, uh, in Russia, they have much less severe influenza infections than those who are not vaccinated. In Africa, many studies have pointed to the uh, uh, increase resistance to infectious disease in those individuals vaccinated by BCG. So the results with BCG and COVID-19 have been contradictory. Some studies have claimed that countries where you have a large use of BCG vaccine, <coughs> they had less COVID-19. This has not been confirmed in other studies. For oral polio virus, there is a study which is being initiated with the GVN, with Bob Gallo, and we will see. But yes, you do have, I would say, 
observation from classical virology and classical immunology, and it really points to the impact of the innate immune response. And again, it doesn't mean that it, will, it would replace uh, the vaccines, it might help. But <clears throat> This is really still very, very early time uh, on this. It is much, much too early to make any conclusion. Wonderful. One second, if I may. Um, one of the question we, a couple questions um, from other people. Sorry, I, I just had a lot of questions myself. Not sure. Um, why? Why do you think CRISPR isn't being used more often? Seems like a very promising and well-known technique. The CRISPR cas, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I take because people. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make when I said that the translation from the technology progress to the routine use is much, much too much slow. Why? Because many. Uh, many groups are not aware of this because they find it very fancy but complicated and uh, and you need to have this consortia between academics, industrials uh, and uh, <coughs> national research agency to really promote uh, the uh, dissemination of this technology. So, but otherwise there is no specific reasons. It's very, very promising. Okay. Um Another question, do you, so let's say we give, we have the current vaccine and we give the vaccine, um, you know, the Moderna vaccine, let's say, and we find out six months later that it doesn't work as we intended, it's not as protected as we thought. What would be, in, in your mind, your next step? Would then you want to vaccinate someone with a different vaccine or what, and you just kind of, your thought process, how that would go? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Uh, well, I would say that at that time, but it's a very, it's also an important question. At that time, I would, uh, I would say that uh, we uh, uh, we would uh, have some comparisons, you see, between uh, other vaccine results, you see. So I believe that we would be, uh, we should be able to answer to, 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 to your question. Uh, uh, so in other words, uh, if we were not efficient in a group of uh, elderly, uh, in a group of immunocompromised patients, it may reflect the fact that uh, you cannot vaccinate this group of patients or that the vaccines are not efficient enough. I would immediately test another vaccine. Okay. Uh, much more based on cellular immune response. Gotcha. Um, the Global Virus Network is obviously very exciting um, at how widespread it is. Uh, in a similar, I think, kind of uh, vein, how can countries that have kind of a low technology adaptation or aren't able to create a surveillance system as easily or as quickly work with other countries that are really highly adaptive and have new technologies. How do you bridge that gap? Yeah, that's very difficult. Uh, so what we, this is where we are using the concept of affiliate centers. For example, we would, within the GVN, in addition to being part of the world GVN, we will identify the, uh, some laboratories uh, in, the, in the country who you are referring to. And then we, we have we establish a very tight connection with another center of the GVN where they really work on uh, exchange of technologies, exchange of uh, training program, exchange of uh, of uh, MDs and scientists. You see, so in other words, we try to have a kind of step by step. Uh, they are part of the world GVN, but again, they have some specific. Uh, companion, I would say, GVN centers uh, to help them. But it's very difficult. And it's about capacity building and it's a general, uh, very difficult problem. Yeah. Um, getting back to the vaccine real quick. Uh, for 
as you said, this is kind of a new era that that we are are currently entering into. You know, we're investing, and we, you know, with with Operation Warp Speed here in the U.S. and all of the investments going on around the world. You know, when is, in your opinion, when is the right time to, you know, I guess pull the trigger on a vaccine and, and vaccinating people? You know, at times in the U.S., it's felt a little bit rushed, um, as far as how quickly it's it's gone. You said, you know, we feel like it's, you know, you made a very good point. Like, what does safe mean? You know, two months of of safety data. And do we feel like it's worth investing so much resources in pushing out a vaccine right now, or should there be a longer time period that we wait to see for efficacy? Yeah, you see, so what we need to emphasize is that although everything has been very much accelerated, the process itself has been the same as for other vaccines, you see? What has been really accelerated has been the process of rushing for the development, yes, and also the evaluation, uh, the, I would say the agenda of the regulatory agency to really have this being evaluated immediately, you see. But the way they are evaluating these vaccines is not different from the other one. So I would say that, uh, again, I, I believe that when you are in a nursing home, uh, in uh, some areas where you have a high level of viral contamination, and we know that many, unfortunately, of these people will die, actually, if they get COVID-19, you see. When you have healthcare workers who are in contact with those people, uh, I would say that uh, the sooner the better, you see. Uh, because, again, but we will wait for the stamp of FDA. And we will wait for the stamp of the European Agency. It seems obvious to tell this, but this is not what is being done in Russia or in China. They have been just vaccinating for several months without this approval. Gotcha. All right, well, thank you, Christian. It's been wonderful to hear your thoughts and thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I think it's been really educational for every for everyone, you know, definitely myself, and I look forward uh, to speaking with you in the future and we will get all of everyone who's been a part of this, uh, the video link so they can listen to this again as they plan. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation, for the introduction and excellent discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Thank you everyone for listening. It's been a pleasure uh, being the moderator today and we will get this out to everyone uh, as soon as we can. Thank you all for being a part of this.